Where exactly is he from? You said northwest of here? Yes, something like that. Uh, it's a place called the Five Highways. Overall, a relatively empty part of the wasteland. The region used to be a major industrial shipping route, so there weren't any big groupings or towns, just these five large highways that connected all the major pre-war manufacturing cities. Most of the old signs had been torn down for scrap metals, so the highways were just numbered one through to five, heading west. The settlers that lived out there had a small farm to grow just enough crops to keep them fed. Anything else they needed they scavenged from the wrecked vehicles or the little towns scattered along the old freeways. By today's standards they had a normal enough life. For a long time the only thing they had to worry about were the occasional mutant creature attacks. My dad was a really happy kid at that point. His parents, well my grandparents, were basically the stereotypical farmers like that famous equestrian gothic painting. New my here? grandfather well, would got work anything in the worth trading, my grandmother would take of the household chores. It was a quiet, simple life. Sounds By good. The time before the old kingdom was set up and everything became so metropolitan. It was their home and they loved it just the way it was. But, of course, a private wasteland hideaway like that couldn't last forever. No one has that kind of luck anymore. When my dad was seven or eight, a new threat had entered the area. All these small scattered communities and the usefulness of the old highways had made the land perfect for slavers. Oh, goddesses. My dad was really playful and lively as a cult. So when he saw the group approaching from a distance, he went and told my grandparents enthusiastically thinking that they were travellers to trade or move in. None of them had heard of slavers in that area before, so they weren't prepared. The caravans had several dozen slavers which circled the village and routed them up in the centre of the town one by one. They were mostly equipped with medium-sized weapons, some rifles and some machine guns, but there were two big enforcers who had mini-gun battle saddles. There was also one sniper who took position with an impressive scope. Once the town was herded together, this scrawny light grey buck walked forward between the two enforcers. He had a long greasy black mane and he was missing his front two teeth. He called himself Fastwick. He tipped his black gaucho hat to the crowd. He announced to the townsfolk that they now belonged to him. While some of his goons walked out with neck and chest shackles, he told my father's villagers to put them on or else. <coughs> Which I'm guessing That's is close when enough, someone stranger. followed up with or else fun. what. We don't want Not any trouble. exactly. My grandfather stepped forward, who I should remind you was a workhorse. That it's okay, I'm friendly. Not looking to cause any trouble. If you say so, but be warned, we're armed here, so don't try anything. Let me tell you, farming ain't easy. Out in the field all day, every day, and every minute of it, spent watching your back. What kind of crops do you grow here? Mostly potatoes so far, but we're starting on melons, Lake Abernathy. You new to the Commonwealth? How long has this farm been here? Generations, I'd say. My father, and his father at least. How about you? Ever think about working the land? He proceeded to flame my grandfather in front of my dad. I'll probably give it a try someday. Well, good luck to you then. Maybe I'll see you at the Diamond City uh, Market someday and damn, we'll do a swap. Word of advice you a lot though, about how if you do start up a farm, are, be ready to deal with the you raiders. Me, Why do all the hard worse. work when you can just take I what you so want too. at gunpoint? Absolutely. Raiders are very different in the whole bullshit they do. Like battered blade experience, raiders are almost like... Raiders are a problem for everyone. Last time those raiders hit us, my daughter Mary tried to stand up to them. Now she's buried out back of the house. Only 21 years old, and they shot her down without a thought. That's why we need the Minutemen back. And the sooner, the better.
and they pretend what men so you know them then. you mean any idea Preston why Garvey's they haven't been around so much lately saying that slavery is he's just over in sanctuary trying to rebuild the minutemen you don't say for people to that's close by if he'd only been there earlier falls away, mary may still be alive i don't have much to offer but those raiders that killed mary the time, they took her the locket too it's been in connie's family for generations if you could get it back they it'd mean a lot to us that's why they don't worry I'll get that locket Rape back for you. Good. You for a Connie days. feels like it's a pot of Mary. Regardless. I don't think she'll Slavery rest easy again as long as it's gone. You for your whole life. And they'll make that life last as long as they can. To squeeze every last bit of work out of you. So, how did your father and grandmother respond to his death? My grandmother totally broke down once the whipping had stopped. She threw herself onto his body while crying hysterically. They had never known that level of violence. The five highways are such a large and barren stretch of land that they had been fairly isolated up until that point. Faswick, the slave master, made one more example out of her. He walked up to her, pulled out a pistol and shot her in the head. After that, the rest of the village fell into a shock silence. My dad was one of the youngest kids in the group, and he had just watched his parents be viciously murdered in front of his eyes. He barely spoke at all after that, for years. He only said anything when the slavers demanded it. I don't even have the words to respond to such a tragedy. Once the town was rounded up, they were brought to the main slave camp. The camp surrounded a small town next to one of the highway turnoffs. The building had been gutted and turned into warehouses. There were the areas the slavers worked and slept. The headquarters of the camp was where the slave masters stayed. It was a three-story motel called the Oasis. Faswick probably chose it for the sick irony. My dad and his villagers walked through the main gate that faced the nice. highway. The chains rattled around their legs as they were brought into the prison they would call their home. The next day, they were given their tasks. All the child slaves, like my dad, were basically sorters. The adults would bring in wagons full of things that they had scavenged from the wasteland that day. They would pour the junk into a big pile and the children would sort through it all put things in different areas based on their usefulness. The items they found were either kept, sold or turned into something else. My dad was the kid that sorted a lot of the electronics they found. As time went on, he'd tinker around with the pieces to pass the time and sometimes to get them working again. This continued on for a few years until the slavers noticed how good he was at fixing their old technology. So they tasked him with doing it full time. He was so good that the slave masters had him inside the main building often, fixing their computers and setting up networks and other machines. My dad considered it lucky because they started treating him better as he gained their trust. Plus, he thought that by showing them everything you could do with machines, it would take some of the spotlight off some of the other slaves to make their lives easier. That's a great idea. Did it work out that way? It did for a while. By getting the generators and other technology involved, it lessened the burden on the slavers by doing some of the harder backbreaking jobs. For instance, Sweet. my dad got a convey about working again, which meant the slaves didn't have to carry those over and covered saddlebags back and forth from the scrap pile to the warehouse. With more machines, the slavers became taxed with more technical operation jobs that my dad would teach them. They went from the hard labour to replacing fuses, resetting the computers and building logic tables and doing machine maintenance. The ones that weren't doing that were scrappers, going out and just finding old stuff for the kids to process or sort. There were still the manual labour driven jobs but my dad had just industrialised Fast Whip's whole operation, which made things better for the slaves and the slavers. 
And they were learning a lot of science and repair skills in the process as well. Absolutely. Based on consumer market, basket slave operation was mainly about two things, drugs and guns. Most of what the scrappers yeah, found were broken and used to fix guns oh, or no hodgepodge to give a new is. ones. I can't Some thank you of enough. the ideas Goodbye. they had were actually pretty creative. There was this one kind of weapon, which I have myself, called the stuff Anderson. gun. I can't it was recommend built around highly these enough. industrial air compressors that could launch anything from a fork to a dinner plate at over 100 miles per hour. It, it turns cutlery or into ammunition? Sounds force. like quite the food fight. Yes, but the only problem was is that you had to... Gonna pass. Let me know if that changes. And it only had one pressure chamber, so anything that was loaded into the gun or got fired at once. It was sort of like a shotgun that would fire whatever you crammed inside of it. Still pretty cool. You said the other thing they made was drugs? Yep. Any chemicals, medical supplies, or cleaning agents got turned into some sort of dangerous drug for someone to snort and inject themselves with. A lot of it was a real waste too. They'd break down actual beneficial things like stims or medex potions into terrible hard narcotics. So instead of benefiting from useful medicines, the chemical cocktails would end up killing you faster than you could enjoy the high. Most of the buyers were raiders or some kind of asshole, so none of them really cared that they were buying things made by yeah. slaves. They just wanted you fought valiantly, and drugs. but to no avail. There were more ones too. Well, my dad came. Your life ends in the wasteland. These chemicals and ammo were dangerously unstable. Fast Slip was losing one slave a month just trying to keep everything working. Then there was. body while crying hysterically. They had never known that level of violence. The five highways are such a large and barren stretch of land that they had been fairly isolated up until that point. Fastwick, the slave master, made one more example out of her. He walked up to her, pulled out a pistol and shot her in the head. After that, the rest of the village fell into a shock silence. My dad was one of the youngest kids in the group and he had just watched his parents be viciously murdered in front of his eyes. He barely spoke at all after that, for years. He only said anything when the slavers demanded it. I don't even have the words to respond to such a tragedy. Once the town was rounded up, they were brought to the main slave camp. The camp surrounded a small town next to one of the highway turn-offs. The building had been gutted and turned into warehouses. There were the areas the slavers worked and slept. The headquarters of the camp was where the slave masters stayed. It was a three-storey motel called the Oasis. Fastwick probably chose it for the sick irony. My dad and his villagers walked through the main gate that faced the highway. The chains rattled around their legs as they were brought into the prison they would call their home. The next day, they were given their tasks. All the child slaves, like my dad, were basically sorters. The adults would bring in wagons full of things that they had scavenged from the wasteland that day. They would pour the junk into a big pile and the children would sort through it all put things in different areas based on their usefulness. The items they found were either kept, sold or turned into something else. My dad was the kid that sorted a lot of the electronics they found. As time went on, he'd tinker around with the pieces to pass the time and sometimes to get them working again. This continued on for a few years until the slavers noticed how good he was at fixing their old technology. So they tasked him with doing it full time. He was so good that the slave masters had him inside the main building often. 
fixing their computers and setting up networks in other machines. My dad considered it lucky because they started treating him better as he gained their trust. Plus, he thought that by showing them everything you could do with machines, it would take some of the spotlight off some of the other slaves to make their lives easier. That's a great idea. Did it work out that way? It did for a while. By getting the generators and other technology involved, it lessened the burden on the slavers by doing some of the harder back-breaking jobs. For instance, my dad got a conveyor belt working again, which meant the slaves didn't have to carry those over saddle saddlebags back and forth from the scrap pile to the warehouse. With more machines, the slavers became taxed with more technical operation jobs that my dad would teach them. They went from the hard labour to replacing fuses, resetting the computers and building logic tables and doing machine maintenance. The ones that weren't doing that were scrappers, going out and just finding old stuff for the kids to process or sort. There were still the manual labour driven jobs, but my dad had just industrialised Fastwhip's whole operation, That's it. which made yeah. things better for the slaves and the slavers. And they were learning a lot of science and repair skills in the process as well. Absolutely. Based on consumer market, Fast Whip slave operation was mainly about two things, drugs and guns. Most of what the scrappers found were broken and used fixed guns or hodgepodge together new ones. Some of the ideas they had were actually pretty creative. There was this one kind of weapon, which I have myself, called the stuff gun. It was built around these industrial air compressors that could launch anything from a fork to a dinner plate at over 100 miles per hour. It turns cutlery into ammunition? Sounds like quite the food fight. Yes, but the only problem was is that you had to reload after every shot and it only had one pressure chamber, so anything that was loaded into the gun all got fired at once. It was sort of like a shotgun that would fire whatever you crammed inside of it. Still pretty cool. You said the other thing they made was drugs? Yep. Any chemicals, medical supplies or cleaning agents got turned into some sort of dangerous drug for someone to snort or inject themselves with. A lot of it was a real waste too. They'd break down actual beneficial things like stims or medex potions into terrible hard narcotics. So instead of benefiting from useful medicines, the chemical cocktails would end up killing you faster than you could enjoy the high. Most of the buyers were raiders or some kind of asshole, so none of them really cared that they were buying things made by slaves. They just wanted their guns and drugs. They were more ones too. Before my dad came along, most of the uh, machines making these yes. chemicals and ammo were dangerously unstable. Fast Flip was losing one slave a month just trying to keep everything working. Then there nice. was the ammunition itself. The tolerance and materials were so poorly designed that the um, ammo was just as dangerous to the user as it was to the threat. Many raiders were having their face blown off from the backfire of their own gun. But, thanks to my dad, the process started turning out well-constructed ammo that offered improved accuracy along with a better chance of not killing its user. Even though that benefited raiders, enough of the clans fought each other that the amount of dead gun bags remained the same. <laughs> so now that the slaves were a bit better off thanks to your father, how long did things last like that? About a decade, by the time my dad was 19 and had gained a great deal of freedom, at least as much as a slave could have. He would walk all over the Oasis slave camp to inspect the machines and talk to the others and see if there were any issues. He did all of the the slaves working efficiently and keep all the machines running. He made sure the slaves ran everything like clockwork, so the slavers and guards wouldn't have to get involved at all. 
His philosophy was to give the slavers no reason to complain or mistreat any of the slaves and do what he could to keep things operating smoothly. The hardest job he had was calming the newly captured slaves. I mean, just think about it. What you'd feel after watching your friends and family die than having to obey and work for the slave masters who killed them? Most of them got pushed to an emotional limit. So my dad had to be there Not as a word, rock to, to, the to help stuff. them settle into circumstances. So your dad would almost be like a therapist, yeah. which I'm guessing was especially hard because no one reacts to trauma in the same way. You're right about that. There were mainly three different categories of slaves he had to help, with totally different ways to address them. The first kind were the criers. They were the ones who weeped all hours of the day, who were totally depressed about the situation. My dad tried to pair them off on different machines with an older pony who had been there for a while. He thought that they would be able to gain their strength back in some pony who had survived and carried on. The second were the fighters. They were the ones that were always taking swings at the guards and getting lashed for it. My dad would try to reason with them. Don't give them satisfaction of whipping you. Keep it bottled up inside. One day, our time will come. I think deep down my dad always envied them. He wished he could lash out and tear fast whipping the slavers to pieces. But he had been beaten down for too long. He didn't have the strength or the courage to fight and had settled on the idea of making their lives as easy as he could. He expected to die in that slave camp. That's probably the saddest part of all, when the circumstances finally crush your spirit. That was the problem with the third category. The ones who were a lot like him when he was captured, they would shut down and become almost zombie-like. Some of them would be okay. They would do whatever task was given to them and slowly come around, but the real tragedy were the ones who wouldn't. They were the ones that wouldn't do a thing. They wouldn't eat, they wouldn't drink. They would just sit there with the vacant expression in their eyes. It would have been long until they were declared useless and thrown into a deep pit outside of the camp. The old well had become a mass graveyard. Any time a slave died, they were thrown in there. Any slave that was deemed worthless would be thrown in alive and would eventually starve to death. The foul smell of dead bodies would linger around the edge of the camp as a constant reminder of what would happen. Name, something about this Just place a looks horrible, a horrible shit. tragedy. That's the kind of evil that makes the wasteland what it is, when things could have been so much better by now. Yeah. So, you said that your dad was only 19, but he had this much interaction with all the other slaves? It was all thanks to him that all the machines were running yeah. again, so Fast Whip was more than happy to let him handle the slaves as long as the products kept rolling Watch off the step. assembly line. He had become the head slave of sorts, and was trusted enough to run the operation with a lot of autonomy. Unfortunately, my dad's innovations just made Fast Whip more powerful, because everything ran so smoothly, Fastwhip devoted most of his time and too good. many of his men to finding and capturing new slaves Psst, along Bob. the five highways. His operation was getting larger all the time. Seeing his plans work against him was starting to wear on my dad. He was feeling guilty for his role in things and he was starting to consider what else he could do. At the same time, Fastwhip wanted to have a tighter control of all the slaves. So one night, he brought my dad into the Oasis Motel building. Fastwhip explained that he wanted him to build bomb cars so that he could use them to control all the slaves remotely. My dad felt like he had reached a crossroad. There was no way he could build such device and he felt it would make him even worse than the slavers. So he had to think and come up with a uh, answer he would hope would satisfy them. He said that the only radios that would work were the ones like found in pit books. He knew the unpopulated pre-war land of the five highways meant there shouldn't be any stables for 100 miles around. Why is that? 
because they were mostly built near the big cities so that citizens could get to them quickly before the bombs fell. Even before the war there were barely any towns along the freeways. They were only meant to connect the far distant big cities together. The three dinky story oasis motel was probably the largest building for hundreds of miles. Fast whip set the answer and dismissed him. My dad until he summoned him once more a few weeks later. He was brought out to the front by the main gate, where three dozen freshly fitted slaves were standing, each of them wearing a pit book on the leg. Fast work began to the I'm not done with you. Take a look at this <laughs> You fought valiantly, but to no avail. Your twisted and ruined body goes down in a hail of bullets. That includes a few. And thus ends your life in the wasteland. I would the vacant expression in their eyes. It would have been long until they were declared useless and thrown into a deep pit outside of the camp. The old world had become a mass graveyard. Any time a slave died, they were thrown in there. Any slave that was deemed worthless would be thrown in alive and would eventually starve to death. The foul smell of dead bodies would linger around the edge of the camp as a constant reminder of what could happen. Just a horrible, horrible tragedy. That's the kind of evil that makes the wasteland what it is when things could have been so much better by now. So, you said that your dad was only 19, but he had this much interaction with all the other slaves? It was all thanks to him that all the machines were running again, so Fastwick was more than happy to let him handle the slaves as long as the products kept rolling off the assembly line. He had become the head slave of sorts and was trusted enough to run the operation with a lot of autonomy. Unfortunately, my dad's innovations just made Fastwhip more powerful. Because everything ran so smoothly, Fastwhip devoted most of his time and many of his men to finding and capturing new slaves along the five highways. His operation was getting larger all the time. He was starting to wear on my dad. He was feeling guilty for his role in things and he was starting to consider what else he could do. At the same time, Fastwick wanted to have a tighter control of all the slaves. So one night, he brought my dad into the Oasis Motel building. Fastwick explained that he wanted him to build bomb coals so that he could use them to control all the slaves remotely. My dad felt like he had reached a crossroad. There was no way he could build such a device, and he felt it would make him even worse than the slavers. So he had to think oh, and come up with a word. answer he would hope would satisfy them. He said that the only way was that would work were the ones like finding pit books. He knew the unpopulated pre-war land of the five highways meant they shouldn't be unstable. Even before the war, there were barely any towns along the freeways. They were only meant to connect the far distant big cities together. The three dinky story oasis was probably the largest building for hundreds of years. Fast whip seemed to have cancer and dismissed him. My dad thought that was the end of the issue until he summoned him once more to the weeks later. Where three dozen freshly captured slaves were standing, each of them wearing a pit book on their leg. That's where it began addressing them together. Take a look at this lot of faces. They are descended from stable dwellers themselves, and all of these beautiful little trinkets handed down to them from their ancestors. That includes a few more whose owners don't need them anymore. 
to turn to the stable dwellers. Which one of you knows the most? He held up the heavy gun that the slavers had killed. I do. The man at the front stepped forward. She was an earth pony with an aqua coat, a white mane with soft blue stripes and bright purple eyes. Her name was Avalon, and she was the leader of their village. Her mark was a lavender energy crystal, like the kind you use to power arcane devices. But before she could say anything else, a mother stepped up and the good her stuff. back. She was an orange-coloured unicorn with a soft yellow mane. Her mark was an image of a stable tech server with a notable green tint of its screen. Her name was Amber Glow. Your mother. The first mayor, really Abalone, looked horrified, like Amber Glow had just taken the place to be executed. But it was no use. Amber Glow's mark gave her away too easily. It was obvious she was the one keeping the pit books running all these years. But Abalone was still hard pressed to let her go. She loved her too much and was afraid to watch her little sister die. Sister? Yep, my aunt Abalone was in tears as she watched my mother walk forward. I years ago, engineer I never would have thought this level of dust. Fastly oh. approached her like a slithering snake. That's good to hear. I'm going to need you to remove them pit books from your buddies. I'd have my men do it, but they aren't as careful. No sense losing a leg over it. The bastard laughed and then motioned my dad. You'll be helping, Sparky. Turn them into the most useful tools. Well, more useful to me anyway. Fastwhip then walked off as the other slavers took them into the camp. My dad walked beside my mum. I'm so sorry this happened to you. He said to her, his voice shaking with guilt. I I told him I needed pit books to make his bomb collars. I had no idea any of you existed around here. Please forgive me. I not believe how this place sets fault, off my cleaning. She says back to him. It would have happened one way or another. If it weren't the slavers, it would have been something else. My dad was taken back a bit. My mum had certain weariness in her voice. Like this had happened before and she was going through the motions. But before he could ask anything else, my mum had handed him a pit book key and started taking him off her villages. Those are pretty sad circumstances to meet each other. So Hopefully their first date like one. <laughs> In a way, once I had all the pit books, my so dad took her to the corner of one of the warehouses that he used as a workshop. He had several terminals, tools and other equipment lying about so that he could use them to build anything. My mum seemed interested right away. She was uh, marvelling at the collection he had put together. She talked about barely having any space in the small sheet metal cabins that she and her sister built in the village. Most of the town had been built out of metal frames from wagons, cars and a few airships. From there my dad told her about how they stripped cars themselves, mainly focusing on the engine parts and the uh, spark batteries. Both of them were basically self-taught engineering and scientific skills. And now they yes. each had someone to relate to in all the strange things they encountered along the journeys. Like my mom miswired a heatsink and melted a terminal. Or that one time my dad used the wrong kind of metal to make a gear so it blew apart inside the gear box. Being enslaved was the last thing either of them wanted to talk about, so they ended up in an in-depth conversation about programming and technology. The one thing that has always brought them together, they could shut out the rest of the world and focus on whatever they were doing with their horns and hooves. They were never more alive than when they were building something together. That is how you could tell, even nice. at the very beginning, that 
into the night. My dad, despite his claim, had never seen a pit bull before. So together they broke one down. And my mother was telling him about everything. My dad had said ah, they no, took to him in the station, that they compared it to. Alive. My aunt Abalone said that they both told her about the first night with the same radiant glow in their eyes. It was an immediate spark, like they were made to be together. That was Bad. their first date. And despite everything going on around them, it worked out to just be hey. perfect. Hey, I'm all in. That is just so sweet. I think I'm gonna cry. After a few days of the romantic re-engineering, though, Basswhip showed up looking for the progress on the uh, bomb collars. He strolled into the warehouse with one of the big enforcers and the sniper that was with them when they first captured my dad. My dad tried to come up with an excuse about how they were matching parts and getting the electronics figured out, but all Fast Whip saw was a destroyed pit book. If you wanted them breaking down, I could have just had Ripper here step on one for you. What I wanted was I a little stupid wrist radio converted into a stupid neck radio with a small block of plastic explosive slime inside. Now, I may not be a scientist type like you, but it doesn't really seem that I no, I He then glared at my mum, assuming that she was the one stalling. He grabbed her by her tail and pulled her in towards him. He brushed the tooth down her back in a threatening manner. Perhaps you need a better lesson in our things work, won't you? Knowing what was about to happen, my dad spoke up quickly. Wait, she was just... she just took a bit of time to adjusting on the first day. She didn't really take well, to change her well. Well, need that anymore. But I've spoken to her and we've been working hard since then. Punishment will only shut her down once again and delay the conversation. I need to break the individual encryptions of each unit, which she won't be able to focus on properly. Fastwick thought about it for a second. He wrapped his arm tightly around her neck. My mother was breathing fast, looking at my dad while waiting for an answer. Fine, he said. You have a point, and luckily for her, you're here to keep her from doing stupid things and impacting my system. He released my mum, and my mum ran back to my dad's side. As he was leaving, Fastwhip turned and said, you would not I want a dozen working units by tomorrow night. And then he walked out of the warehouse with the other two slavers in tow. My mum cried tears of relief as she clutched around my dad's neck and he calmed her down. Holding her there under the clouded moonlight, my dad found his goodness. He replayed every horrible thing Fastwood had ever done, all the way back to his parents, threatening my mum had been the last straw, the final spark that exploded like a bellfire bomb. Nothing stirs a man's anger like threatening the woman he loves. With new determination, my dad had hatched a plan and told my mum his ideas. As the days went on, my parents worked quickly. My mum did most of the programming while my Sweet. dad had disassembled the pit books and put the colours together. At sunset that night, they went around each of the machine stations so they could tell every slave what was going to happen as they were switching shifts. My aunt Abalone loved the idea and couldn't wait to get revenge. She was feeling guilty that she couldn't do more to keep them from getting captured. After a short rest that night, they worked all the next day getting the collars finalised. They looked at the finished pieces, knowing everything was in place and hoped more than anything that this would work. Fastwhip arrived at sunset. He seemed very satisfied with all of the pit books converted into bomb collars. The enforcer ponies walked up with plastic explosive putty and gave it to my dad, who started putting Bingo. them into the units. While he did that, my mum showed them the terminal and began explaining how the colours worked. 
They're set up in a numerical sequence, she began by saying. All you do is put the name of the slave by the number in this main terminal. That's the master registry, the one that will stay here in the hotel to keep track of all the slaves at the camp. Then, if you take any of them outside of the camp, you just register their number to one of the slave master units. She motioned to the four pit bulls that looked basically the same as they did before. As they looked, my dad hid a block of explosive beneath his workbench. You set a designated range and all the slaves assigned to that device must stay within a certain distance of the slave master's pit bulk. Once they leave that area, a steady beep will begin to let them know. It will give them 30 seconds to get back in range before blowing up. When a slave master returns, he simply presses the return to camp button on the menu, and the slaves will be released back to the main transmitter again. All you have to do is connect these two wires to the steel framework of the building and it will act as the main transmitter within several miles of broadcasting range. Fastwhip ran a few tests with the equipment after blowing up the heads of clothing mannequins. Seemed quite satisfied with the work. Good work, Sparky. He said in that same sleazy voice. I'll be equipping tomorrow's away party with this first patch. I've got that locket we'll back for you. You serious? That's great news. Soon enough. Connie's gonna be and you girl, I'm sure she'll go tomorrow. lean on her prices after you what you've done. And shoulders. feel free to use our workshop. Least we can do. She turned away and my dad had to hide a sharp scowl.